Please be seated. Councillors, ladies and gentlemen, in the unlikely event that the fire alarm being activated, please exit the town hall at the nearest exit and form up the separate points which is exchange flags to the rear of the building. Please ensure all the above rooms are switched on. Chief Executive. Good evening, Lord Mayor. Good evening, Council. <coughs> Can I advise members that apologies for absence have been received from Councillors Mary Aspinall, Nick Crofts, Ruth Hirschfield, Lily Hennigan, Bill Jones, Janet Kent and Pauline Walton. Are there any other further apologies, please? Can I remind those present that this is a meeting held in public and not a public meeting. I would also like to emphasise this is a key public meeting and can I therefore request that everyone present, including the public, Treat this meeting accordingly, which will enable the business to be dealt with efficiently. The use of social media and filming for reporting proceedings is permitted during council meetings. This does not extend to the filming of members of the public and anyone wishing to film the proceedings, but also particularly directed to the very sensitive issue of filming children without the express permission of their parents. Today is Remembrance Day, so can I ask members please stand while we observe two minutes silence. Thank you. Please be seated. Can I advise members of the recent marriage of Councillor Liam Robinson and to extend to him and his wife on behalf of the Council its best wishes for the future. Also, the engagement of 
councillor Emily Scullo and to extend to her and her partner on behalf of the council its congratulations. The minutes of the City Council meeting held on the 16th of September 2015 agreed. No. Councillor Radford. Um, can I say, I, I do this for two reasons. First, it should be a matter of public record. But secondly, I'm not sure I've, if I'm the only opposition member who's actually fed up with mayoral announcements being a way to attack to opposition members, their motives, what they've done, and then have no right to reply or right to ask questions. I would like to move on the minutes after the words the three lines Mayor Anderson explained to account for the background of his recent employment at the tribunal and the application city council. No opposition members were allowed to ask questions because that factually took place and I find it very strange whilst we were attacked for what we may or may not have done or what we may or may not have written to somebody who claims to have made the decision. Um, we were not allowed to ask questions. I think it's very strange that whilst our motives and our, our record can be challenged here in mayor announcements, uh, we have no right to respond and no right to ask even any questions. So I move that minute for those two reasons. Yeah. Well, may, may I uh, comment on that? Uh, Councillor Radford was good enough to uh, raise this with me just before the start of the meeting. <coughs> for the benefit of uh, people in the uh, gallery who are not here last time as well as clarification to members, the Constitution doesn't require uh, answers or questions and answers to the uh, part of this, this part of the agenda. So, in relation to the issue that Councillor Radford's referring to, Mayor has made uh, several statements that are in the minutes. Uh, the recollection board there is that you could shortly uh, the questioning because of the personal nature of it and uh, expect some of the questions that we put to that particular <coughs> So, for those two reasons, that the record of the meeting is the record of the meeting that's presented in the minutes. It is a matter, I suggest, Lord Mayor, for yourself and for the chamber as to whether the uh, motion that the uh, Council of for is put is accepted and acceptable to the Council. Can I just say that it wasn't the Mayor who was not asked to not answer any questions. I, I, as the Chairman of this Council, as the Lord Mayor, in line with other board mayors, along with the constitution said that that was not for discussion that, on that particular meeting. Therefore, the meetings are correct. And I'd ask the chamber to endorse the minutes as printed. Is that agreed? Is it second? Sorry, Lord Mayor. May I ask uh, Councillor Rafford to just read out the terms of the amendment that he intends the Council to consider a vote on? After that line, uh, no questions were allowed concerning the application of the Tennessee Council indemnity. Um, it's, it's a factual statement. Uh, I don't agree that it was just the chairman, the mayor's announcement. I thought the, the Lord Mayor was, was made that response after the mayor said he wouldn't take questions, but that is not relevant. The point Can is just, those questions were Just the amendment, that's all now. So you. you, you... All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? Uh, 
Is there any abstentions? For the amendment six, against seventy, one abstention. Therefore, the amendment is lost. Can we agree the minutes as printed? Thank you. Could I invite Glenn to address the council, please? Good evening, Lord Mayor, Mayor Anderson, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. I am Glenn Fletcher, voluntary chairperson of the Management Committee for Calder Kids Adventure Playground, and I'm also a parent of a disabled child that has attended Calder Kids for six years. Many of you will be familiar with our service provision for disabled children, but for those of you who are not, Calder Kids is the only citywide locked gate provision for disabled children from the age of 16 to 19, providing an after school outreach, term time play and leisure service, and also a place scheme provision during the school holidays. Our experienced and caring staff managed by Donna Trotman provide a safe, secure, tranquil, educational and full environment for our disabled children and young people to play, learn and flourish. Calder Kids not only provides this service for disabled children and young people, but it also works in partnership with siblings, parents and carers and other agencies. To many of our disabled families, Calder Kids is their lifeline. Calder Kids Management owns the building in Hart Hill Road, but leases the land from Liverpool City Council. Calder Kids has occupied this location on Hart Hill Estate for 37 years. Through those years, we have provided service to thousands of young disabled children and young people, funded through Liverpool City Council, accessing many pots of fundraising and welcome donations from the public and local <coughs> businesses, and the National Lottery and other funding streams. Although Calder Kids is located close to Calderstones Park, we are not accessed via the park and we have a separate gate on Hart Hill Road as part of the Hart Hill Estate. The general public do not have access to our facility. We are completely fenced in around the perimeter of our site and we have security lighting, CCTV <coughs> and lock gates. Our current building is not fit for purpose. It's old and in need of repair and as are some of our outdoor play structures. To maintain the same would cost us considerable amounts of money. And as we are like many voluntary organisations and charities, we rely on grants and donations for our income at present. Our relocation will enable Calder Kids to develop and maximise our provision with a suitable building and outdoor land to expand our work. We will continue with our present provision, but the relocation will enable us to develop our sensory integ integrated work, training and therapies and develop a transition unit to support young people who are preparing for their journey into adulthood and adult services. Our re relocation will go hand in hand with the development of our social enterprise that will be a trading arm of our charity. We will tender for work such as sensory equipment storage for higher training and therapies, transition work and independent living, providing training and a meeting place for other disability and community groups providing space and support for repairing care groups to meet and offer schools and other organisations the opportunity to make use of our new facility and provision. We will reach out to so many more disabled children and young people and their families, complement our partners and positively fill some gaps in present provision. 
As we have a Labour majority in Liverpool, we are confident that our present council will continue to support a positive future for our disabled children and young people in Liverpool, in contradiction to the national government and other previous local political parties who have been minimal in their support of disabled children locally at part of it. With the proposed housing development on the land that we currently <coughs> occupy on the Hart Hill Estate, Hart Hill Road, on the outside of Caldestones Park, we are positive that together with Beachy Ride and Stables, we can continue to provide our unique service for disabled children and young people in Liverpool. We are grateful that Mayor Anderson and Liverpool City Council have faith in our work and are continuing to support us in our development by offering us the opportunity to develop a very sound business plan and continue to support with our relocation planning advice and capital receipts. Thank you for this opportunity to address Liverpool City Council. Thank you, Mayor Anderson, would you like to respond? Just briefly, though, Mayor, we're debating this uh, in motion that I've put before the council. I've visited the facility twice. Uh, Glenn is absolutely right that it's dilapidated, it's not fit for purpose, and it's a disgrace that we've still got that type of facility offering support for some of the most vulnerable children in the city. I'd just like to thank and put on record our support as a council to Glenn and all the volunteers that work at the facility to do a fantastic job. Thank you. Chief Executive. Second, uh, well, the second statement to, to be received from Chief Angus in relation to item 13 of the agenda. Could I invite Chief Angus to address the council, please? Most worshipful Lord Mayor, Council Attorney Conception, distinguished members, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be given the opportunity to make uh, this short presentation about the recently formed the uh, Liverpool Commonwealth Association. My name is Angus Chukumeka. As you will appreciate, the Commonwealth uh, is such a, a unique union uh, of uh, countries who are different in so many ways, but work together to promote social, economic and cultural cooperation between its uh, 33 member states. Uh, the city of Liverpool uh, has had a long historical link with uh, some member nations of the Commonwealth, uh, and of course it's a global city and the citizens of this commonwealth uh, diaspora communities uh, in particular people from uh, the Africa, Caribbean and Asian heritage who have made great contributions to our cities uh, developments, its culture, prestige and wealth they also continue to maintain social links with their countries of origin some time ago, a group of people from these uh, Commonwealth diaspora uh, communities uh, came together to establish a Commonwealth Association in the city with support from uh, the Commonwealth Local Government for Rowing, Liverpool, UKTI, Liverpool Chamber of Commerce, uh, Liverpool John Moores University. They formed a steering committee uh, and consulted with uh, diaspora community groups in the city region, uh, Commonwealth High Commissioners and all the Commonwealth bodies uh, for their support. Uh, thanks to Councillor Richard Ken, uh, who offered uh, support to uh, convene the meetings uh, of the, the steering group. Now, th there are three main aims of the establishment and many more. Uh, I not much time. Um, I think number one is to ensure that strong contact between the uh, diaspora communities uh, are made and uh, continued to be made. 
um, to is to develop contacts and uh, links between diaspora communities and the city region and the uh, countries of origin uh, for development opportunities in trade and investment, um, cultural exchange, education and, and health, uh, enhancing the role of the Commonwealth in, this, in the Ipo City region. Now, the proposal to form the association was uh, greeted with overwhelming consensus by uh, the diaspora community because of the relevance in uh, reinvigorating and uh, strengthening uh, the cultural links uh, that already exist between the diaspora communities as well as enhancing the, the role uh, of the Commonwealth in the city region. Now, other benefits uh, include enhancing trade and business links and attracting inward investment into the city. Uh, and as I said before, our city is now a global city with uh, the International Business uh, Festival, the International the, um, Slavery Museum, and the city of, World City of Culture. Now, enhancing knowledge, economy, and attracting overseas students to our city uh, through the support of uh, the universities and uh, promoting mutually beneficial cultural initiatives between our city uh, and Commonwealth countries. Um, also, the fact that enhancing the, the relationship between health agencies, uh, in particular the School of Tropical Medicine, as we appreciate, it's already had, had con has contacts with Commonwealth uh, countries and then um, forming the association will enhance that uh, contact and partnership. Of course, it will also provide research and uh, trading opportunities. So it's very clear uh, that um, establishing the association with the city uh, will open up the door for opportunities uh, for and networking partnership in all the areas that I've mentioned, I've got many more areas. There'll be issues about young people, issues about women, and I mean, Commonwealth about 2.2 billion uh, people in the Commonwealth, um, and about 60% of them are young people under the age of 30. So that is a great opportunity there to work with young people and connect with them as well as women. Um, so it is important that uh, um, we appeal to our city to support it and uh, at this stage I will uh, thank uh, the Liverpool City uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Anderson, uh, for his support so far uh, and um, our new chair, Gary Miller, I'm the vice chair and the councillor Natalie. So we've got that broad support from all sectors, it's non-partition, non-political, and I'm delighted to uh, ask you to support it. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you, and um, I hope you will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Angus. Could I ask Mayor Anderson if he'd like to respond? Just, just briefly to say that um, uh, thank you to all those in, in involved with this, Councillor Kemp, Councillor Miller, Councillor Robley and Councillor Nicholson, uh, and others that have been engaged in, in this, and also uh, to the communities here in Liverpool. It's often uh, overlooked just how strong uh, the Commonwealth United is. I think often we uh, go out and we try to form relationships with uh, America, North America, um, China, for instance, and we overlook uh, the strong bond and strong relationship that we have with the Commonwealth. So it's absolutely right that we uh, address that and look to not only form 
uh, stronger trade and business relationships or cultural uh, relationships too. So I look forward to offering the support on the uh, motion before us, but equally uh, to develop those relationships and work and to form a, a stronger partnership with Liverpool and the rest of the Commonwealth. Lord Mayor, a request has uh, also been made uh, by Bob Hennessy of JTUC to address the Council in respect of item 12, the Trade Union Bill. That would technically require a variation to the Council standard orders. Is it your wish that we make that variation? Agreed. Agreed. Could I invite Bob Stan to address the Council, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, Deputy Mayoress, and Mayor, there you are, and uh, councillors as well. Um, I'd like to start on behalf of JTUC by thanking councillors Hanson and Hont for bringing to your attention tonight a very important issue uh, that is, is uh, being raised on the agenda. It's for good reason that organisations such as Liberty and Amnesty International have spoken out in opposition to the Trade Union Bill. And we're here tonight to, to echo those concerns. Trade union members are hard-working people. They provide public services in this country. And our members need our MPs to focus on the real problems that the country faces. We don't need our MPs waging irrelevant battles against trade unions. I particularly, though, like to bring to your attention a number of concerns in particular that we have over this bill. Trade unions improve the UK for everyone. Trade unions are a fundamental part of UK society and we have had a positive impact on all citizens through achievements such as a national minimum wage, improvements in health and safety conditions, improvements in uh, equality legislation and so much more. We believe that MPs... <laughs> Sorry. We believe that MPs should come and talk to us about how we can work together for a better future but at the moment we are not getting that from this government. The Trade Union Bill has some particularly uh, pernicious uh, elements to, to, to the legislation, in particular, the use of agency workers during strikes. This policy undermines the right to strike and could make public services unsafe. It's highly unlikely that agency workers that are used to break a strike will have the same uh, safety and quality training that is currently held by, by workers uh, who may take strike action in the future. The bill also undermines the right to peaceful protest and it could result in asbos for people on picket lines. It needs to be understood that when trade union members take strike action, we already comply with a detailed code of practice. But this bill will allow the police to issue asbos to people on picket lines and it is quite simply wrong. <coughs> peaceful protest is an important part of an open and democratic society. And there should be no place for a law that makes criminals of people who are making their voices heard. The bill will also impact on core union activities through restrictions to facility time and the removal of check-off. The bill will restrict trade unions' ability to campaign on social justice issues by attacking our political funds, making it so much harder for us to engage in national and local campaigns, be it hospital closures or fighting for fair pay for public service workers. And importantly, the bill undermines the right to strike because the bill will subject trade union members to unprecedented levels of civil and criminal penalties, regulations and other requirements that will effectively end the right to strike. Council, the option to go on strike is an important democratic right because although it is only ever used as a last resort, it provides working people with another opportunity to put pressure on their employers to solve disagreements. We've got a really good tradition in Liverpool of working with your officers in the council uh, to good effect in partnership working. For that reason, the only industrial action that's taken place in this city in the last five years is national action over pay. We have a good relationship with the, with the employer and we want to maintain that. And this bill is absolutely unnecessary, not just in Liverpool, but throughout the UK. So I'd like to end by saying this. We believe as trade unionists that it's time for the government to get its priorities straight. This bill is an attack on the very people who could be part of the solution to the country's problems. 
The trade union bill is unfair, unnecessary and undemocratic and MPs need to focus on the real issues that the country faces and talk to us as trade unionists about how we can work together for a better future for everyone in this country. And I'd like to end by this, by inviting all of you to the public meeting in Liverpool on Friday in the Line Hotel at 6.30. Let's stand together and join our voices in opposing this trade union bill. Thank you. Just briefly, Lord Mayor, I think Babs uh, summed that up quite eloquently and quite passionately uh, and said exactly what the Trade Union Bill is. It's a police charter uh, to try and stop and stifle democratic rights. When I was elected as leader of this council six years ago, one of the first things I said was that we will uh, protect and defend our trade unions within this city and I urged uh, all the workforce within the city to join a trade union. I repeat that message today. Now more than ever you need to be part of a trade union. As a proud member of Unison I urge you all to join a trade union in this city. What I will say uh, to Babs and to all of the trade unions represented here tonight, this council will continue to work with you to defend your rights. We are proud of our record together that we've been able to overcome some of the most vicious attacks and cuts the city has ever faced. We would not have got to the stage where we are today without the cooperation and without the friendship and partnership of our trade unions. And it's absolutely right that when Babs mentioned the only day of action was a national day of action and tribute to our trade unions, they agreed with me that the money that was saved as a result of that day of action went in to support the most poorest and neediest in this city and gave that money to food banks and other people. I will pledge here publicly that we will defend uh, your rights as much as we can, including, including defend the right to have check off within this council and include the right to defend facility time for trade union electors elected representatives within this council. Together, we will continue to work to support one another. Urging key executive decisions, May Anderson. Well, May, can I um, submit the report on pages 17 and 18 of the council um, and just ask for council to accept that, please. Are there any questions? Can we note the report? <coughs> Announcements and updates, uh, Mayor Anderson. Well, May, just to. Um, Say an update really on, on devolution uh, and the negotiations that are being taken place with city lead, region leaders. Uh, there will be a special meeting of the council on the 19th. It is my intention to try and meet with leaders uh, prior to that to discuss and present to them exactly uh, what has been negotiated between the city region leaders uh, and the government. Um, make no mistake, however, I just simply like to point out that uh, it is not uh, a deal that uh, I would have preferred to have made, I would have preferred to have made a deal with the Labour government, but we are where we are, and if we uh, don't accept the deal, we'll be in a, a very, very, very difficult position. But we will make uh, the deal clear uh, to council leaders uh, and to councillors. I believe diaries uh, some people can't make, uh, but I will uh, try to facilitate one-to-ones uh, -one with leaders uh, and with their group members as best we can. But there will be a special council meeting uh, on the 19th and also, as I said, prior to that, there will be presentations. It will be for this council to decide, as it will be 
for councils in other districts across the city region to decide whether we accepted the evolution package on the 19th. Um, Councillor Crowe. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, can I just ask you a question, seeing as this came into the agenda after this, this announcement was made after the deadline for questions? So, just a quick question about this. Um, is that okay, Mayor? Um, just wondered, um, obviously, the decision seems to be getting made that the devolution deal will be agreed for the city region. Can the Chief Executive confirm what the effect will be on the position of Mayor of Liverpool? And also, if that's going to affect whether there are elections next year. The, 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 the name, the title of this is the Mayor's uh, you know, opportunity to update. So I'm not allowing, I'm not allowing the Chief Executive to answer that question. I will answer it. Provided this is agreed with the City Region, then we will discuss that with this Council as the sovereign body that governs the City. So any decisions on what happens in the future or whatever regarding this city, regarding this city council, will be taken by everybody with discussions and with debates made available for people yeah. to have their input and their say. It's a bit presumptuous uh, of me or the chief executive to start predicting what might or what might not happen uh, prior to a debate taking place and a vote taking place by the sovereign authorities of the district councils. I don't think there's any more to say in that. You know, I appreciate the fact that it's only come to you yeah. in short notice, but that's the reality of the, the Devo deal that we've been having with government. It's not been uh, the way I would have liked it to have been done. I'd like it to have had another three months, and certainly would have liked more things to be debated and discussed. However, we are where we are. And I don't think, as I said, neither I, the Chief Executive, or anybody can commit to any other arrangements, to, at least until we see what those other authorities are doing. Thank you, Mayor Anderson, for the qualification. Can we move on item six, changes in committee memberships and appointments of outside bodies? <laughs> Councillor Dean. Chair, the uh, changes have been set out to all members and can I ask members to approve them? Is that agreed? agreed. Item seven, constitutional issues. Councillor Dean. Thank you, Lord Mayor. In the past couple of months, there's been some confusion amongst members about what happens to motions that aren't selected for debate. Um, constitutional issues considered this at its last meeting and determined that those motions that aren't agreed for debate today will automatically go to the next relevant select committee or appropriate committee following uh, that city council meeting with the proviso that the member who moved the motion can withdraw it if they so choose. Members, we've got a copy of the formal word and we ask members to approve it. That agreed? agreed. Item 8, Councillor Christine Banks. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, every three years, the uh, Gambling and Licence and Commission asks all local authorities to do a consultation. It, it, it's an annual thing. Uh, we did ours in the past 12 weeks. And um, at our select committee, uh, did the consultation. Councillor Palasong attended by the, the Councillor Small, attended asking the committee for the support on the dangers of the uh, uh, fixed odds betting terminals. These are gambling machines that are in betting shops. Um, these machines that are in these betting shops are causing massive problems to the people that live in our communities, young people, people become addicted to them. You can actually bought your uh, uh, card in it and within a minute lose £100. Uh, I've asked a, mo I've, a mother's parent come to me and, I, and tell me that her son, one weekend, lost a thousand pounds in these machines. Another young man that I know of lost that much money. He had uh, gambling debts with uh, loan sharks and he tried to rob his money back out of these machines <coughs> and got back the on. So, uh, Councillor Sun came to the committee and asked us uh, to endorse uh, and put forward uh, the, um, a recommendation uh, and the recommendation that the current way in the paragraph C12 went through the gambling machine, that the draft statement of the principles 2018, which was set out in uh, pages uh, 19 to 64. Um, 
we need to actually move on this. Councillor Brennan and myself have been working on this for the past three years. And we have, we've been uh, approached by other authorities three years ago. Chester and Westchester was the then chair of license and council in Barney. Uh, uh, asked us to write to a, a chair of the LGA, which, which was sent down to Westminster about the uh, problems that we are having. And it's not just here, it's everywhere. So I'm asking this council to move the recommendation of the Licence and Gambling Committee, which was held on the 28th of April. And um, if you need any more information, email me. Okay, thank you. Is that agreed? Agreed. <laughs> Item 9, the appointment and designation of the Director of Public Health, Mayor Anderson. Well, where can I move that uh, Dr. Sandra Davis be appointed and host as Director of Public Health on a permanent basis with immediate effect? Is that agreed? Agreed. We are now moving on to motions, and can I remind members that, in terms of the timing of speeches, the movement of the motion gets five minutes, and has the right of reply for five minutes. All other speeches have three minutes, and two minutes for an extension, if agreed by the Council. Item 10, can I invite Mayor Anderson to move the motion standing in his name? Happy to move that motion in my name, Lord Mayor. First amendment, Councillor yes. Richard Kemp. Well, can I, before, uh, um, I talk to the, the amendments, just make my uh, contribution and then uh, reserve my uh, rights uh, at the end of the debate. Well, when, when we became uh, the administration, we faced some hugely difficult financial challenges as uh, people uh, in this chamber know, including the removal of £350 uh, million pound in building schools for the future, and also £127 million pound housing market renewal uh, funding. And you may well ask the question around what has that got to do with Parcel Road and the uh, motion that we have uh, before us. But simply, Lord Mayor, I raised that fact. Uh, because the same politics uh, that was played around what we chose to do with our schools uh, and how we would fund them is being played out again today with the amendments that are being moved. The fact of the matter is, I remember one of the Liberal Democrat councillors, um, uh, she now left uh, the council, talking to us uh, about uh, the new Hayes site in Allerton. And she said um, that using that site to build houses on, which was an old school site, was actually selling off green space. Now, of course, the site was ring fenced, the site was fenced off and the public couldn't use it. And we had a dilemma because we needed uh, some of our schools to be rebuilt because the coalition government, uh, including their party, had withdrawn the £350 million uh, building schools for the future programme. So what I promised and what I pledged to uh, the schools community within this city is that we would try uh, and endeavour to do as much as we can to build those schools. So what we did is we made sure that when there was a derelict school site uh, and where we were building a replacement school for them, that that site was sold and the money that came from that site was ring fenced into the fund that was building the new schools. And I was up at uh, two primary schools in Wavertree over the last uh, week, one in Kensington and one in Wavertree today. Um, and that's uh, Northway Primary, uh, I was there today, and also New Park, uh, I think on Monday. And two amazing uh, primary schools with the head teacher and the pupils delighted because of the investments that we've made. And of course, we know that we've delivered on 11 secondary schools, uh, including uh, two